Welcome to Village Poets Reading. Here I have one of the amazing figures of strange beauty that Casa Bella, our feature for today, has made. Today is February 28, 2021, and we have a lovely group of poets. With me in the picture is Ambika Tawar, and on the other side, Boris Thatch. So there's three of us here, and we have lots of lovely poets and friends who are participating. So this is a beautiful artwork that Casa Bella was working on for years, it seems, before it gave rise to the whole book of images and poetry, and this is the subject of the uh, reading for today. So uh, we will get to the feature in a little bit, but first we should start with some of our poets that are here for the open mic. So is anybody willing to start? Please uh, unmute yourself and go for it. <laughs> I will. One Thank person. You, Maya. Okay, bravo. All right. Well, I started a poem last night or two nights ago with the full moon, but it's still a work in progress. So it's not quite ready to read, but I went back and dug up some of my old full moon poems back from 2017. So I'm gonna read two of those. The first one is called Full Moon Transmission. There are no others, only sisters and brothers. All are mothers and fathers, regardless of fertility. For fruitfulness is in the soul and transmits to human digits, making feet fleet for justice and hands open for giving. Living goes beyond existence. It is found in relationship with humans, creatures, and nature in universal truths that surpass divisions. And then the next one is called Full Moon Burn and Release. I don't know if anybody has ever done that, but it's been a practice I've done for a number of years. You're supposed to write down three things you want to get rid of and burn them under the full moon. Mm. So this is full moon, burn and release. Ah, uh, yet another full moon, burn and release under radiant winter glowing moonlight. My lunar friend must certainly be laughing at me. How many times have I burned the same three words? How long will it take for me? to give up my worst traits. Perhaps I should write good things on fragments. Perhaps corners of newspaper I think would work well. Forgoing flames for natural deterioration. I can deposit them in my potted plants to provide compost to aid growth and maturing. On second thought, better yet to bury both ash and scraps. Good and bad, yin and yang, Manure and food, for friend moon causes tides to push and pull. Just as dark and light propel myself, my soul somewhere far beyond, while I journey upon dirt as my soul flies skyward. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Okay, we need another um guest poet to read who would like to raise a hand i don't see everybody let me see you gallery view who would like to read oh tara 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 is is uh, ask you on mute okay so tara so it's your turn okay um um this one um i wrote um for it's for my son actually okay um, blue heart-shaped earrings bought at the dime store when you were eight. I wear them during COVID, my only contact with you. Wow. And I'm wearing them right now, <laughs> but they're hard to see, so. Yeah. But, yeah, you can send a picture of them. Yeah, yeah, so. I'll yeah. send it to people. Yeah. So anyway, I'm, I'm wearing them right now because That's, I miss him. I miss yeah. him very much. I haven't seen that him. That was before. lovely. Do, do you have another one? Um, sure. sure. Um, okay. A dog lifts his leg, a dedication of love, like carving his initials on a tree trunk. <laughs> 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 All right, very good. Thank you. Uh, we have another volunteer to read. 
Oh, Joe, Joe. So we'll have Joe unmute and mute Tara again. All right, Joe, it's your turn. Hello, am I unmuted? Yes. Oh, thank you. I'm doing this from my telephone for the first time. Uh, 10 minutes before the meeting was to begin, my laptop crashed, and I don't know what's going on with that. Um, so I'll just try to hold this phone so you can see me. Craving of the coyote. Crisp silence shepherds long shadows of dusk. Heavy arid night ushers movement in the brush. Twigs snap, leaves crinkle beneath stalking paws. Frenzied howls surround fearful eyes. The craving of the pack yields no escape. Yelping, barking, educating pups on the art of conquest. Thoughts of my companion missing from my sight spur my flight inside. My knotted stomach hinders movement to each room, overturning each chair along the way, every closet open, every hamper emptied. The screeching of the wild ringing harder in my ears, terror dominates the peace. Each menacing howl becomes a fang, incising my intestines, leaving wet anxiety pooling on my neck. You're deaf to my voice. Your name bounces unanswered off walls of vacant rooms. My parched mouth searches for drops of water on a sand dune. Unable to breathe, I swallow air like mouthfuls of paste while glinting eyes on a cluttered desk of paper bring my relief. The chorus of howls fade. The quiet creeps back, but for your purring on my lap. <laughs> and this piece, um, last month I was unable to attend. Uh, a high school teacher of mine and lifelong friend uh, was going into hospice. And I was grateful that her family involved me at least into preparing the area that uh, she would be spending her hospice time. And I got to uh, spend a, a few last moments with Joanna. This is titled The Favor. Of course I will. No need to even ask. Merely imply and your soul's desire becomes my crusade. I will hike the Himalayan trails on my knees to gather the exotic fruits you crave. I will descend a lake of lava to unearth the brilliant crystals you adore. For you, no pool of broken glass is too severe or deep no fear of laceration too intense to hinder my resolve to rescue any hope or ensure your dreams stay luminous. Mm. Or so it was when once we walked together on carpets of contentment, when the world unfurled before young and healthy eyes, when nothing could obstruct the parade of plans that took our senses to the peak of life's enticement. I would have done anything for you in exchange for the inspiration, the guidance, the clarity you gave me. From crude materials, you took a sense of importance and sculpted a man. Anything at all, but this I cannot do. No offense to your sensitivities, no affront to the endless shrieks and cries that seem to go ignored from the darkness of your cave. Does my sympathy filter through the briars in your head? Can you make any sense of the person holding your hand? Would you have me force a pillow on your face or sever the tube that gives you air? No, there'll be no favor until mercy visits. Thank you. Yeah, very sad. Thank you very much, Joe. Very sad story. Mm -hmm. But I love yeah. your wish for luminous dreams. I remember yeah. that line especially that you would you would do anything for that. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's I don't know if you've ever had uh, family members or friends in that condition, and um, the doctors do everything they can do just to try to make them comfortable, but when they look at you and you see through their eyes and they, they ask you to kill them is a terrible 
um, position to be in. So um, I was just grateful. Yeah, she she um, mercifully uh, passed away not long after that. So. Mm, that's really hard. Yeah. Yeah, that's really hard. Well, we ha we have a artwork entitled "Thoughtful on a Beach." found wood placed mm -hmm. on a rock can you see yeah mm -hmm. it's kind of reflecting a little bit so you can see oh there it is yeah. you can see that yeah so this is my found wood based on rock and original print and i will read it instead of introducing casabella because we know casabella uh, and she has an amazing uh, life story of an amazing achievements and i just read what she wrote on the back of my image your creature was discovered and created by Catabella on walks on the rocky Arroyo Burro Beach in Santa Barbara. Others have been found in the green hills of suburban upstate New York, in the San Francisco area, the suburbs of Chicago, in Pasadena, in the mountains of North Carolina, in the hills of Wyoming. The process is calligraphic and inspired. The objects are found and put in place, sketched and photographed. The process consists of one, finding the creature or significant object, Two, placing it in its dramatic context and everything involved is found on site. Nothing is added. Each flower or the scrap seen on the photographs is found on site. The pieces are not altered or enhanced. Sometimes two or three elements are combined, but no glue to keep anything in place and a minimum of construction involved. The uncovering, visual recognition and placement is considered the art. Number three, photographing it. This is the most vivid result of the work preserved, presented here. And number four, an on-site creative ink sketch of the creature in its dramatic stance has been made. A framed copy or original is available. And number five, the creature is usually left in place and nature continues to take its course. Usually the ocean takes it back. Although many hundreds of creatures are documented on the uh, uh, approximately 75 wood or stone original creatures were removed from the site and are now in captivity. So that was in 2005. You, I don't know if you have your creatures still in captivity. There you are. <laughs> Creature in captivity. Yeah. I never, never throw them anywhere now. Ah, I here's, see. Here's the, the one on the cover. I still have this one, which is... See it carefully. That is the cover image. Yes. Of the book. Looking. Yes, it there. is different yeah. color though. In the yeah, cover, yeah, it's yeah. yellow, and here it's gray. Because it was so wet. I think. Ah. You no, know, I think it was so wet when I found mm -hmm. it that it did have that shade. I remember it being this color. Mm -hmm. so it's Pretty accurate, but then it, then it fades as time. Maybe if I leave it in the sink for a few days, <laughs> it'll, <laughs> it'll it will get, get yellow again. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, so, that's right. Thank you, everyone. It is wonderful to be together, like we were before, as close as we can come to it now, and all we've shared. It's been really a difficult time, but then we fly our kites and climb mountains and have our friends from international countries come and join us at our meetings. So there are many wonderful benefits that we've had from this time as well, well as difficulties. So um, I, this is really the first time that I have talked about this book. I've never talked about it before. It's never had a launch because it was finished at the beginning of the pandemic and there was nothing we could do. So um, we just wait. But coincidentally, if I was thinking about this this morning, I told people to take two years to read this book. They shouldn't read it all at once. So now maybe we're catching up with ourselves because it took me two years to take the journey that this book is. And it really is a journey. To me, it's different from most books 
When I was um, years ago, years ago, I was reading and studying and I was even a research assistant for a professor in New York that was doing a book about James Joyce. And James Joyce wrote Ulysses. I was very much influenced by his work and immersed in Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake for a long time. So I feel the evidence of that is primary. I don't think I even mentioned it in the book. Um, it, it is an odyssey and it's 18 chapters. There are 18 poems exactly. And that evolved while I was writing it. I didn't say, okay, I'm going to read, write an odyssey. I decided that I was uh, suddenly inspired to write the first poem and it developed from there. So like life is a spontaneous odyssey from beginning to end. That's what this book is. It's, and what you were saying about discovery discovery and wonder what what I mentioned at the end of what you read, Maya, that's what life is. And so the book mirrors that. The book, um, I'll show you, I have, um, I have some pictures that will show you what was going on at the time that these poems came into being. This, this is the street I walked on every day. It's called Mesa Lane. It's on the Mesa in Santa Barbara. And our home was at the top of this street. Down the center of this street are eucalyptus trees. And you'll see there's one poem called Mesa Lane that's really important in the book. Um, but this is the context, the beginning of the walk, and you go further, and it looks like this. And I'll give you a hint. I saw this street as a great poem. That's what it was to me. When I entered these poems, I was entering a world, a spontaneous, created world, that seemed to have such a powerful identity. And this street was part of it. I love that car turning. It just seems perfect. So at the end of the street were these steps. And I walked down these steps every day for, for many years. And for the two years or more that I wrote the poems, the 18 poems that are contained in the book. It's not a collection. That's another interesting about the thing about the book. It's an odyssey that follows ultimately. There's nothing I could do about it. It was pressing on me the whole time. And I went from one poem to the other over those two years. Some of them were quick and some of them were long. But just like the progression of those stairs, the book came. And that was exercise for me. I went down those stairs and up the stairs. I walked along, along the beach at the bottom and things waited for my discovery. That was the experience. The, poem, the poems are not about the creatures, actually. Figures and humor of, and of strange beauty are figures of humor and strange beauty I called the exhibit of the uh, images uh, that too. But actually, this is what I did when I got down there, as well as let the poems happen. But the poems happened in their own time and in their own place. But this was a, ultimately an important part of it. So this one was just um, a piece of wood. <laughs> and a little nest-like thing and a feather. And I just stood it in the sand. Those cliffs had a beautiful color that day because it was right after high tide. There's another more simple looking out to the sea and you can see the environment of the poems. And this, I love this one, looking back, I think I called it. I used to find, I have hundreds of, 
of images that draw a circle and uh, I let it be like a compass. So it's making its own footsteps. And that also, you'll feel it in the poems. You feel the context of those figures. In a sense, I became one of them. And that ultimately found myself. That's what the book is about. Uh, this one was one of the the late evening walks. And that was a piece of rusty spring that I found. So um, it has a magic. And I always, this piece of wood was in the ground for weeks. And I would put different things in its hands. So that one was very special. Uh, this, after um, I came home one day, it was an anniversary dinner. We went to a friend's house and they made this beautiful meal, which just gives you a little sampling of what my journals were like. And this is 1997. The journals were like this. I documented everything. And uh, this was the meal they made. It was a little uh, lemon sorbet inside of a maybe um, a melon cup, something like that, hollowed out. And so, and lots of wine and champagne, you can see. So that was an influence. And then I, I found on the side, it was actually up here. You can see that little head. I drew this and it says, I bit the stone in half. Now, on the plate in this picture, my friend, which is funny, on the plate, you don't see them. I think I was demonstrating their swirls, but actually on that plate, there were cookies shaped like animals. And one of them was a stone given to me as a gift because my friend knew that I love stones that had shapes. And so she gave me that stone. And in fact, she's the one that wanted to come today and wasn't able to, but she did enough. She put that stone on the plate. And so I went home, fell asleep and woke up in the night as I sometimes still do. Some of you know that I write at night and send you things. Um, this is the first poem. And I wrote this after that meal, I'd fallen asleep and I woke up and this is what I wrote. At the foot of the stairs, the stones lay in wait. At first, she held, felt the heaviness of their silence. She held her tongue and wished to hear a voice. Later, she began to carry them home. They gradually took over her house from all the ledges and shelves. They stared down at her. She was charmed. It, it went away and wished to understand. Um, let me see. This is the last thing, so you don't actually have to see it. Um, her third wish came true when she began to eat them. One by one. Luckily, the first was small and light. And it was when it cracked between her teeth that she began to hear them speak. There we go. So, Figures of Humor and Strange Beauty became a book 
um, maybe 22 years after it began being written. Thanks to Glass Liar Press, thanks to Lois P. Jones for in introducing me to the publisher. And this is thanks to Cretab Editions, which is an archival uh, element in the publishing of this by this press. So this, this actually incorporates the background in the book. And that's one of the special things about this series. And you can see there are 18 poems and uh, has a chapter on archaeology at the end, which I'll show you. And uh, I made the titles in a few minutes before I had to send the manuscript in because they needed titles. But they didn't have titles all along. In fact, I called them the she poems. So here is where my suggestions are for how to read the book. Uh, Lana wanted to have the dinner party. I thought you should have an 18 course dinner party for the book and take two years to write it otherwise. And so this tells some of what I told you about. You'll see that in the book. And it's interesting that we chose to put this uh, stone that was my sketch of the stone in the book. Yeah, the stone uh, that was done on site. All the things that I did there, I did sketches of. The poems were done in, and there's the poem again that I just read you. And then you can see just little sketches that I did a few of them on site. So in that way, the figures, the actual creatures are part of the book. But the actual book is about the odyssey of going from one part of your life to another. And I didn't choose this topic. This one, some of you have heard, which is a journey that I took in my mind, that seemed so real. I think I did it on an airplane. I went back to the places where I grew up. I thought if I would tie them together, they would make some sense. And so she went and did it. And what happened? It turned into a big knot. And <laughs> she came home and had a good story to tell. So that was, the, uh, that was what that little odyssey was. And then uh, there are other little incidents that happened in our house. The poems happened whenever they wanted to. And I felt constantly, um, constantly uh, impelled at this slow pace to write them. So you can just scan what you see. If something is really special, I can read it. You can tell me. I definitely want to read you the finale, which really is the point of the book. There are very few people in the book, but there are some. This was the person that I lived with, and I sat there listening to the sounds in the night. This one was a hawk that was sitting in the backyard that I watched. Tara would like how you to read Monarchs. Actually, I would like you to read every second one. So out of 18, we will hear nine. How about that? <laughs> I could do that, but I really want, the ending is quite long, the poems. Oh, so, okay, but uh, Tara is asking for monarchs, so let's okay. listen to monarchs. Okay, monarchs. It was a day for crossing the shadows of birds, she noticed as she walked. She sat on the ocean, facing the beach, leaned backwards and floated out across the channel. She touched the islands gently with her fingertips, then stood feet upward 
and eased over the islands backwards. From the other side, the sight of the clear blueness made her feel at home. Before her, ocean and sky unobstructed as far as she could see. Suddenly, she turned in the distance on the beach, standing beneath the shadow of a solitary large bird riding the wind, hovering, she saw herself. It was the time of many monarchs, and as one flew by lightly, orange across the shadow, it broke her spell. She walked up the stairs, away from the beach, and back to her home. See what the next one is. If I can try reading every, you want me to read hawk, Maya? Yeah. Okay. I like birds and I have a hawk in my backyard hunting every second day. <laughs> oh, every second day and every second poem. It yes. seemed to come to her in a dream. It seemed to come to her in a dream. The body of the hawk was covered with hieroglyphics, white against auburn. They glistened in the sunlight that filtered through the trees to the branch over the creek. They reminded her of a favorite stone. Those words are very important. <laughs> She had found in the sand months ago at the moment she gazed into the eyes of the hawk. Still, intense, patient, she imagined herself floating into a deep canyon. The red brown walls were covered with rows of fine white markings. She was exhilarated as she moved in one long breath through the air slowly across and down. And as she did, the signs began to resemble faces, long and noble, and each had a mouth that was a door made of interesting old wood with metal fixtures and each felt inviting as she passed as if to enter any one of them would be to know the answer to some question. Danger. Ocean. <laughs> it's fun to look at this. These are friends that were in and they brought they they brought home stones for me. So uh, I like the end. She could not remember biting the stone, but when he kissed her as she came in, he noticed that she was strangely quiet and her lips were salty. This one is fun. I don't want to take too much time, Maya. Should I worry about time? I don't think so. I think everybody's here for you to listen to okay. your book, your poetry. So don't worry about anything. It's Thank beautiful. You. OK, this is a slight accident. And this actually happened. I used um, unfolding books like this. Let's see. This is what the notebook that the first poem was in. So it's an accordion book. New steps to the beach, she thought. It was a sudden realization as the wind had come and taken.
taken the fan-like pages of her unfolding book down toward the blueness beneath. So it was going over the side of the, like that. It was going over the side of those long stairs just hanging down the whole book. She had hold of its cover, but she saw it sway cloud-like toward the sea. It seemed almost to disappear. Her head was full of the sound of the rising tide, and she felt that she too might vanish. It was the sound of her own writing that woke her from her blank reverie. She saw faint black tracks fade into the distance, small graceful marks freshly made climbed up and down the whiteness and seemed to know where they were going. For hours she stood between sky and sea, gathering and folding the pages back into themselves and then into the blue covers that held them. So I rescued the book. <laughs> Okay, so you saw Mesa Lane at the beginning of this. Um, and this is, this is the poem called Mesa Lane. I, it's very special in my mind. First lines sprang into her head and fell at her feet. She walked on the long strips of bark discarded by the trees. This was the street that she lived on and she walked there every day. She had felt for a long time that it had been built by someone as a great poem. It was a magnificent conception and humorous too, she thought. A poem she could walk into. Cars even drove through it on either side of the long straight line of tall, wide trees. She felt the space around her full of activities. Words leapt from her mind and scattered as she went. At her feet, the crisp pods exuded the strong scent of eucalyptus. On her many walks, she counted and recounted the trees as if she were remembering dreams fixing them in her memory. The pattern of their planting filled her imagination. The two or three shorter ones changed her count every time and strangely interrupted the long thick strokes toward the sky. Where there were gaps, she stopped and listened to her own breathing. There were two out of line at the end, which she never knew if she should count. They stood apart from the rest like sentinels, watching over the place where the poem leaves off and the ocean with its loud voice begins. I like that. Mm -hmm. All right. Reminds me of theater class. <laughs> I picked up a stone and just put it by in someone's front yard, one, one glowing stone. I put it by a tree and it just felt so special. I didn't even think they'd notice. And that's a good uh, illustration. I never even realized that that was. Uh, that probably had to do with it, but it was a drawing of the creature. So this one, Suspense, got a, a, a nomination for the push cart. Um, but I've read that quite a bit. And it was special because this was before the book was, was published or recognized. Um, that poem was chosen for that award or, and, that was very special to me that it was like, oh, well, maybe this book will be published someday because that poem comes from it. So why don't we hear it? 
Um, uh, how many have heard it? Anyone? I don't remember. I don't okay. remember. I'll read that one because it is, it's special, especially to me, because it has to do with all of you in a way. It's, it has to do with friends. And you know that everything that I do, it seems, has to do with friends and the realizations and discoveries that we have at our meetings. All of that is one thing. And that is really a big part of my life. So in her dream, she slept in the thin curved cup of the moon and the reflection of the earth was upon her. She saw herself among the friends that walked together along mountain's rim. Pam Shea, you are walking in the mountains. <laughs> to the highest point at end of day, then stopped and stared over the edge up into her eyes for the time their city was erased. They had stepped into her dream ongoing of gold and white, slow moving silence. This poem was written in a, in a car. We were driving in the mountains and stopped looking at this. And that's what the poem was. There were two friends, four friends, two friends of ours were there and we did this together, only this is what she was doing. <laughs> and she brought them with her. For, that for the time, their city was erased. They had stepped into her dream ongoing of gold and white, slow moving silence. Then different and yet the same. They slid into a dream of light, a stream of light that carried them. Her thoughts became stars. Their hearts became trumpets. Sweet and clear tones bloomed into the night, held in suspense. Their lives were their accompaniment. We all know what that feels like, but that, that really was a special moment and it's what we all feel. We're in our lives and out of our lives. And before I go further, I have to tell you, I had a lot of resistance to doing this reading because this book was written so long ago and it's true, it's never had a launch, which is funny in a way and thankful to Maya for inviting me to do this. But I said to Rick after thinking about it, I think I'm going to read my new work. <laughs> And he said, oh, but I love that book. So thanks to Rick, we are reading this book because that was his reaction. Okay, bravo. <laughs> Thank you. And I meant to tell you before is that when Rick, I think the, Rick fell in love with my poems first. And be before me, because... <laughs> <laughs> we went to a French restaurant having having lunch, and I had written that first poem. And other, I think by then other of the poems were written, but I read that poem to him, and he thought it was wonderful and really laughed. So so yes, much. so I felt I loved that he loved it so much, and so he really encouraged me from the beginning. Um, he loved the first poem, cool. and that was love, love at first sight, right? <laughs> so, so mm -hmm. <laughs> Why don't you read this one, 15? Okay. <laughs> I just it's really, long. it's long. Okay, but her map, it was a startling discovery. She looked back into her past and saw herself moving through an immense tableau. It surprised her that all these years she had not noticed. There were gaps in her experience, times when she would stop and stare and often write a poem that would have nothing to do with that time or place. Later, 
when she read it, the words were a key that unlocked her memory of the smallest detail of those moments. She saw herself in her pose and the objects around her returned with the clarity of her favorite dreams. Only recently had she begun to rearrange things. First, she placed a white stone at the foot of a small red leaf tree. Now she watched critically the fall of a single leaf and noted the position into which it fell. When a small purple flower with golden center poked its head up alone through the gray iron grill work bridge she crossed, she smiled approvingly. What grew or was scattered was part of her tableau. She watched with interest and dreamlike assurance, moved things, making distinct but subtle changes spontaneously and with a natural sense of ease. She noted them carefully in her book and began to move through her tableau with a sense of familiarity and recognition. It was a dream she could return to, to adjust, to reshape on her walks to the sea. The colors and forms she had chosen moved her imagination. And in the dark, before dream, her memory became a map. She visited the sites of her constructions, each in turn, until with a sudden hush, she would step into the world she had created as once a white heron delicately stepped into her poem, into the silence of a sunlit garden, into the stillness of late afternoon, into the sound of a fountain spilling over. And her eye was its eye, serene and slow, a feather curved and trembled in her tableau. She watched for the smallest breath of inspiration. <laughs> Drawing the mm -hmm. This was a time when it was very, very windy and rainy in Santa Barbara, and the trees fell down, some of them, across the street on top of cars. And to me, it was a difficult time in my life, too, and it felt very metaphoric of, of what was going on. Uh, so that's the context of this poem. I like that looking up. So this is 17 and the next one is the end. Should I read those two or should I skip to the end? Just read, read both, I think it's good. All right. okay. Yeah. okay. This is a good one because it connects with with others, with you, with you, you could say. It was, was it not her, but another who stood in that attentive pose beneath the tree near the top of the stairs that led to the sea? So it's a question. Was it not her? It's almost unbelievable that people are separate sometimes, that I could feel this pose of another like it was mine. So was it not her, but another who stood in that attentive pose beneath the tree near the top of the stairs that led to the sea? I saw this happen. Everything in the poems is actual fact that I experienced. They're all real experiences. There's no fantasy really in, in this. So I saw someone doing this and that's what started this poem. She held her breath, 
one arm out straight, eyes closed, then pressed her palm flat against the tall eucalyptus, fingers pointing upwards as if to feel a pulse, as if to leave a mark. She listened. Was it the end of her last poem? that came to her through the long silence. Dark lines that came in waves, repeating, turning white. They were the cloud that carried her. She felt a sudden stillness sink as if the birds that filled the treetops over which she moved fell silent and in daylight went to sleep. She walked the fine line along the edge of multiple awakenings that rose and spread along the shore to disappear. She became a wing that brushed against the window where she slept in interlocking dreams unfolded. With open eyes, she heard again the sea. Or was it a voice that came to her through the dark channel between days as a prelude, flute-like, resounding with words she did not know? They came to her in long white diagonals toward the shore. It was in that moment that she found herself walking away from the tree awake, pen in hand, in the midst of her next poem. Mysterious, but all true. Okay, this is it, her book. There was a certain ecstasy to the uprising that gave her voice. She felt it in the air around her and in the long saturated earth. The winter rains had been intense. The storms had raged beyond their season. Now she was crossing the bridge into a world that was the result of such excess. This was her poem. She created as she walked one long line through the overgrowth of flowers. It was her path to the sea. From the overwhelming debris, each day she posed one solitary shape of wood or stone at ocean's edge against the sea and sky figures of humor and strange beauty. She created them with her eye, their singular gestures caught in that moment before speech, poised before the ocean's indrawn breath, about to disappear. In the afternoon light, she saw her favorite rock further along the shore. She walked quickly toward it in the rising tide, knowing her back fit perfectly into its curves, anticipating the rise and fall of syllables that would absorb her and the space between waves where words would be the spray that moved her. She posed herself as she had posed the others. The tide rose, the sun slipped into the sea as it painted her silence. She was alone on her rock that seemed to drift out amidst the deepening water. She glanced back to where she had walked on that narrow beach as if fallen flowers had upsprung to bloom again. Her creatures gathered in simultaneous return, each to its place, mouths open, gesturing toward one another and the sea.
I have to read that part again. I love it so much. On that narrow beach, as if fallen flowers had upsprung to bloom again, her creatures gathered in simultaneous return, each to its place, mouths open, gesturing toward one another and the sea. Released, invoked, she did not move, but seemed to join them. They had gone beyond speech, become, become one voice, they as if from the distance. She looked once more, there was an empty beach. She turned and gazed, the ocean had become a blank page alive with gold sparks glimmering as if with creatures and constellations beneath the surface where they stirred again she relaxed into stone curves and as if to what was read aloud continuously turning transparent pages spread over her lightly. She breathed between waves of words and heard the whispers of their torn edges against the shore. Immense above the sky, a watch with stars. She watched until one with bold strokes fell from sky to sea. And in its flash, she saw herself on her rock. She was an illumination in her own book. Wow, very beautiful. It's really hypnotic, this book. I really like it that it's all connected and found and you find interconnectedness. Oh, there's something else you want to talk about, archaeology. So that last poem, for almost a year of the two, two to three years that I was writing, I made notes because I felt the poem coming and I would write the fragments of the poem in the book. And I indexed three journals, like thick, thick journals, but shaped like that. I indexed them with the pages that the fragments were on. And then in the end, we were visiting Rick. And I sat in our, in his living room at that time. This was before we were together. Uh, and on the coffee table, I spread out all my journals and all those page numbers and I put them all together in this room that last poem from all those fragments they just fell into place and that's how that end the journey the odyssey ends where this odyssey <laughs> begins yes and so the archaeology is one of the little, um, it's fascinating to suddenly find yourself your own archaeologist. And that's what I was doing, publishing this book, looking into and under the objects you have kept and all of that. And I'll just read um, the end. I wrote, this is the only bit of new work that <laughs> is in the book. And I wrote this and published it in the British Journal. In the second hand store, surprised by familiar objects, dream journals, handwritten and drawn, treasures, a colorful life of someone who used to be me. So that was what it felt, it feels like being your own archaeologist. Thank you so much. Thank you for the chance to read this. And Rick, um, you can tell, Rick will tell you what it was playing. Uh, it was sort of a flute. It's a Native American style flute of, a, of an ancient type. It's not like the modern type, which is played like a whistle. This has a, it's a hollow tube. And it's uh, the original, it's a replica, is in the Museum of Man in San Diego. And it's often called, the style is called a desert flute. 
it's rather limited. I only have four finger holes, so it's hard to get a lot of notes, different yeah, notes. That's a lot of notes. <laughs> so beautiful that we could do that together. Um, it was beautiful that Rick and I could do that together. So he was beginning, he was with me from the first poem to the end in a sense, although we knew each other as friends during the writing, but not as partners like we are now. So. But it really was the last poem was actually written in this room. Wow, <laughs> very nice. Very beautiful, Catabella. Thank you for sharing all very, of this. Yeah, it's Thank a beautiful you so much for wanting me to share. And actually, you know, it would be nice to for you to record the whole book. Yeah. Because it's a very continuous thing. Often poetry books have all sorts of stuff going from this to that and that I again. Know. That's the but thing. That's what it is. About. About. It's an it's odyssey, so it follows. Yes. What is the word? Not ultimately, but with a power that leads it. I, dynamically, it, there's no choice about the order of the poems. <laughs> they were written in that order. They put themselves in that order, and they're, they're just, there's no way of changing that. So it's not a collection of poems. It's really an so, odyssey, a journey. It's a, it's a real it's journey. An ineluctable journey. Yes, ineluctable. Ineluctable. Yes. Ineluctable. Nice That's a choice. It's a choice <laughs> word, too. When they were walking, the ineluctable, what is the line? It's when he was walking along the shore, I think, and with his own eyes closed, he said ineluctable, ineluctably, or ineluctable. So, Gabriela, you know, hearing all the poems and your experience, and I was mentioning to Maya, and I thought you should film this not as a reading only, but as an experience where you're enacting what you are saying. And the, in parts, the voice could be not you reading it, yes. but already recorded. And so uh -huh. you would change some clothing, you know, the, the, the twigs, the, the ocean. That, that's how I see it, you know, like a one, one woman show, really, with all of these beings that you have. Yeah. Recorded. I could imagine yeah. that. Yes. That that way you can take us on the journey. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, thank you for coming with me today like this. We didn't have an 18 course meal, but in a way <laughs> we're all satisfied. <laughs> so we're very well satisfied. <laughs> okay, I need to go to the phone. So you'll take over, okay? Sorry. Kathy Bella, I have to tell you. Um, I love that uh, your, the street, your street name. I grew up on Mesa Lila Road, so <laughs> I always knew we had a connection. Oh, who's talking? I can't see it's you. Pam, it's Pam. Oh, Pam. Pam! I don't know why I can't see you. Yeah. No, I don't know either. But <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, thank you. That's way. great. That's great. So now I know why we have. We've always had a connection, and that affirms it even more. <laughs> well, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Okay, okay, that was so lovely. Now, is anybody else uh, wants to read anything after that? Do you want to have an open mic, or do you have any more comments? We had two poets read. Thought you would like to read something? Oh, the next one will be uh, March 21st. Totti and Cindy Lynn, they have a new book. And Totti is actually the artist for the book, and Cindy is the poet. So we're going to have poems from that book, as well as uh, Totti will read some of her other poems, but she will talk about the artwork. So that's March 21st. So it's in a month from now. But for okay. now, um, it, it, anybody would like to read? Let me see you in a screen that I can see everybody. I would like that. Todi, do you have yeah. anything? Well, uh, yeah, I do. But essentially, yeah. I wanted to say that mm -hmm. I spent so much time with your book in the past, like, you know, that I thought they had it completely, but I didn't realize how much I missed your voice and how much the, the dimension that add is incredible. And so uh, it was like restarting and having another four levels of depth just because of your voice. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I was wondering because I know Tody has read the book very closely and re written about it even. I adore that book. 
but today it was like a completely a complete rediscovery. I, I have, you know, just through your voice. So. I wondered how you would feel about it, you know, and I just told the story as it comes from my own experience. I didn't analyze it. I, I feel I it. recognize it. I recognize it. So yes. what I had yes. gathered from the book without your explanation and without your voice, I recognize it all. So uh, Do you feel amazing. like you learned new to it? Was there Besides my voice, were there new aspects of it? Yes, the, the thing that has been already told, the fact that you interacted with the reading and you could, you know, stop in the middle of the poem and give something more, it made it yes. totally natural as it was. Thank you. So all that you did, the way you relieved it uh, was wonderful. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and I'm going to read. I'm going to read because the poem that I had uh, picked up, actually, I think they can follow. So we okay. can share the screen uh, here. The first one I chosen was terminology. As I struggle to translate into my mother tongue the word sooth, when I saw like that during a conversation, I produce it at every turn, I'm carrying a why. I can't possibly find a proper equivalence. The two words that in my vernacular come nearest to sooth, if translated in English, are comfort and caress. They were in my mother tongue, my mother's favorite words, those she ceaselessly reiterated as a mannerism an unconscious plead, a confession, perhaps all the above. I just hate them, comfort and caress, like an overdose of saccharine leaving on your tongue, a sour aftertaste. Yet I can't translate sooth any better. <laughs> I can't render its smoothness of stone rubbed by sea water, its tree light, mm. its coolness, the grace of its chant, two round vowels gently tapering down, the ability it has of sitting in silence without patting you on the back or offering hugs, saying it all will work out. Oh, no. Sooth says nothing, says <laughs> nothing. That was just wonderful. So this is, is that... when we're sitting on the beach. Uh-huh. Is and that in one book? of your books, Toadie? Is that no, it, it is it is in the manuscript I am working on right oh, now. It's beautiful. It just feels so right. It feels like it's part of everything <laughs> that I, I was reading. You know, it follows. Mm -hmm. We could connect. And, and maybe also my second one, which is pocket science. Within the dream mind, words are walls of suitable size, low enough for you to sit upon or else kneel as if in front of an altar, brushing with your fingertips the seams between stones. Within the dream mind, words are walls made of stone, never larger than the sum of your wide open arm. All else, words form shelves lined with books, thick volumes, perfectly bound, that you would gladly keep, but just for the assurance, deeper knowledge you sense would not be of use. Within the dream mind, Sentences come in short clips, like a trim, just to hem a cuff, half a color, one you can attach with a single length of thread, one session, one page. Never say words, sentences, and periods make a curve, only straight marks, like slightly stretched and dashes. Always portable carry out, carry on, even in their ponderous versions made of mortar and bricks. Even those you can lift and shift at your leisure. 
hear words don't dare make in the discourse, know their limits. Ample room is left for quiet. Silence, breathing in and out, contemplation. The unexpressed, inarticulate, the ecstatic, the pure vision, a wide, unobstructed vista, dune, desert, path, erasing itself in the distance. So that was for you, Catabella. Thank you, thank you, thank you. That's lovely. Oh, and that. what about Maya? All right, so I've been working on a remake of my book, uh, The Rainy Bread, mm -hmm. and I uh, did one uh, of the poems uh, in the workshop uh, yesterday, but I would like to read one that I never read anywhere, so I don't know if it works or not, because it's always you always figure out a poem when you hear it aloud. Mm -hmm. Baranovice is a city where my mother was born. Once upon a time in Baranovice. This city is a cipher without a face, just splinters of images cut on paper, my mom's old photos. A blustery winter street with a round poster stand, just like in Warsaw. An opulent interior of the studio with a birth skin for naked babies. A mahogany stand for First Communion girls with rosaries and lace gloves. Flowers for Marshal Pilsudski, tightly held in a fist by the prettiest girl with dark locks of curly hair. That's all. No childhood street corners, no velvet and masking curtains, no church bells, some forgotten shrines. This was the site of battles. In 1916, 100,000 dead, less than the 700,000 of Verden, and known to no one. Still, each life matters. Once more, Baranovice. Here, 48 priests and teachers murdered in cold blood by Germans, Soviets, the German woman disappearing in a ghetto, half of the town gone. The Soviet rule meant crowded freight trains to Irkutsk, to Arkhangelsk, to Kazakhstan, the Gulag archipelago. For me, this city is a cipher, only existing as a birthplace of my mom. Lucina tells a different story. Bus trips to Svitesh, Mitskevich poems, silver ponds and grandpa's farm. The family home, her mom says, stood on a hill near a pine fir forest with broad meadows full of flowers and all sorts of birds spreading out. Skylark sang, soaring high above the fields. From the courtyard, you could see dark forests looming in the distance. In May, white bells of the lilies of the valley picked by the bucket, heavenly scent. In July, gold fields in bright sunlight, sunflower heads huge as dinner plates. In September, the Soviets came. Nothing could save them from deportation, ruin, you know, the usual fate. Mm. Wow, that was enlightening. Was that from a specific event or just the, the general conduct of the Soviets? In that this case? is a specific event. Uh, in February, on the 10th of February, they started deportations. They deported 1.5 million of Polish people from Eastern lands. And uh, actually, the deportation started early in the 36. They wanted to clear the lands, ethnic cleansing, right, of the Polish people and leave it for the, whoever was there left afterwards. And my uh, my mother uh, escaped with her, her parents and brother. They managed to escape the deportations. But I met somebody in, a, uh, in California, actually, whose parents, grandparents, took the same route exactly, except they were caught. At the river that my parents, my, my grandfather, my mother and grandparents managed to cross, but the other people were caught and arrested and imprisoned and, and exiled to Siberia and ended up in Argentina, of all places. And uh, my friend Lucinda, whom I met here, we found out that our mothers were from the same city of Baranovice, which is halfway between Minsk and uh, Vilnius, uh, between uh, Belarus and Lithuania, which was a part of Greater Poland some time ago. Anyway, so there's a sense, uh, she gave me a poem of her mother's, so I quoted 
from that, the description, how it looked like. And I thought it's important to capture those lost moments of a country that will never be because a lot of these little villages and family farms, they're all completely erased. And even the maps were redone, so there's no trace of the names of these places unless you find a historic mm -hmm. map which still has mm -hmm. them. They plowed over all the, all the villages and even churches, all everything mm -hmm. was completely erased. So that was the, and I thought since I know about this, I should write it out. So it's a kind of a tribute to my parents. Hmm? We want your book. Well, and I finished. <laughs> so I first, I just had a couple. I started after my mother died and I realized I never recorded these stories and I uh, am forgetting them already. Mm -hmm. I'm getting them all mixed up. So I have to, I can only write them out as poems because they may be not exact. And then I, when I did that, I had those two little books, the uh, Slicing the Bread and the Rainy Bread, which was more specific about Siberia. And now I thought, oh, I, I wrote from that time on, from uh, 2014, I wrote quite a few more poems about various other stories, which I uh, basically transcribed the story, what happened to somebody, a family or a person. And these are the stories that don't make it on the news. So I transcribed these stories in as simple language as possible without embellishments, just telling uh, as it was, trying to find out what happened. So yeah, it's a kind of a, I guess, it's a, a, it's a work, it's a like it's a, like yeah. a family historian in yeah. a way, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's important to keep yeah. it right. Yeah, because yeah. we won't forget if we don't write it down. Yeah. I, I already forget a lot of stuff and, that's why I have to write about it too, because yeah, we have to write yeah. about these really strange yeah, experiences yeah. had. Mm -hmm. Oh, Cambodian. Yeah, don't worry. Don't tell about your story oh, a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, because my my family came here in 1988, so I was born in a refugee camp in Thailand, in the border of Thailand and Cambodia. So I I don't have a country of origin. So when I came to the U.S., I have just my green card, and when I joined the army. It, on my record, it has no country of origin because I have no citizenship anywhere. So now I'm a U.S. citizen now. So this is wow. my, my first country of citizenship is the U.S. So you're native, like a, a <laughs> real American. Yeah, pretty much. Like, I don't have any other uh, citizenship prior. And um, so my brother, you know, he went the other path. And because, you know, with growing up in, in impoverished neighborhoods and stuff like that, you get influenced by the street culture and you know the people around you so he's he's um gotten in a lot of trouble and then he's been getting uh he's been in prison and they wanted to deport him but they couldn't because like i said we have no country of origin wow. so they they have he's like in limbo wow. so to keep so they, what they do is they release him after he served his time and then i tell him every i always tell him like you know you're very lucky because if you were from any other country you'd be gone right now they would send you away because you're not a u.s citizen you're mm -hmm. you don't have anything but you know like we all have these unique moments which Katha Bella is talking about so observant so mm -hmm. attentive to the little flower that sprouts mm -hmm. by your rock right and i wish in each of our lives we have this uniqueness at the same time we have interconnectedness so i think it's really important yeah. like we were talking when we were flying our kites this <laughs> afternoon how uh bori was a paratrooper and would jump out of a plane I mean, i've never jumped out on a plane but i like flying my kites and imagining <laughs> i'm flying in the, with the kite in the air i would never physically do it but this is something you know that that's just like a connection well, like a line yeah it kind of it triggers a emotion yeah I like it, yeah experience just it. like with this this yeah. book is so beloved because it just touches you so you know i'm a sheep which also helps so i'm like <laughs> i'm walking with you on this little mesa street and i'm counting the trees and why are these two trees are too short and what, what, <laughs> should i count the one that's short and out of place and kind of different mm -hmm. it's really how how we kind of the process of thinking you know the kind of experience of the world of the physicality of the world as it manifests yeah. to us and when you really pay attention to it we all connected both to the world and to the rocks we eat the rocks <laughs> we taste the saltiness and then we connect it to each other it's kind of strengthens the connection it's so magical about this book yeah i think it's really lovely so thank you very much Catabella. yay right now. Uh, Catabella, you muted oh let me unmute you Ooh, you're saying something uh, that they muted you because there was noise and uh and thought he was reading let's unmute everybody again because we only have a couple of people. We heard a lot of, oh, very good. 
Yeah, there was some extra noise then. I love in your poem, Maya, those dramatic contrasts with the sunflowers and the describing the beauty as well as the horror. There's a lot that really struck me in your poem. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it makes it makes me very uh, uh, grateful and for, just, fortunate, you know, like I, I was pretty much very, I was sheltered and, and shielded from all the stuff that goes on in, in refugee camps, you know, or you, when you're in the middle of, uh, you know, war-torn countries and stuff like that. You, you were born in Cambodia? And I was born in uh, Kawadang, which is a uh, village outside of Cambodia, but it's on the border with oh, Thailand. Because yeah. that's the only uh, neutral area uh, at the time with the wars going on and stuff. And, and this was within Cambodia, its own. Uh, yeah, because, uh, you know, there was the war in Cambodia and then there was the war in Vietnam and uh, and the war in Laos and everybody was all mixed up in there. He was a man, I, I had, yeah. he was a peace, he brought peace in the country. What's yeah. Um, I, I can't remember his name either. You're right. I know what you're talking about. You know, my um, but my parents. You know, she. They they they, they tell me it's, uh, you know, history is always being rewritten. Yeah. You know, because the uh, the the countries, um, the people that take over the countries, they change everything. They change the histories. They they change the villages' names. They change the provinces' names, mm -hmm. and they try to erase, like you said, the maps and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard to go back and try to find out find out about mm -hmm. it. So. It's good to write it down and it's, it's good, good to record to it. it. That's why we should write each write our own maps, like <laughs> Isabella did. Just write the terrain, describe the terrain, describe mm -hmm. the map of, of individual experience. And I think the world is all the richer for it when we do it. So thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. That's lovely. Okay. Do you have anybody else? Only didn't read anything. Ambika. Ambika? Okay, Bella, I didn't bring anything, and I'm really, really enjoying just, just listening and and being part of that experience and uh, participating through, through you know your world. So thank you so much. Thank you. I could feel you were from what you said. So thank you so much for, for listening. So thank you. And feeling it. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, that was really magical and lovely. And thank you, everybody, who could stay to the end. And I think we will just say our goodbyes now, and we'll see each other on mm -hmm. March 21st at the same time, 4:30. So thanks one more thank time you. to all the beautiful poet Casavella Wilson, to Rick for playing the flute for us, and to mm -hmm. all the poets who played and uh, read their work for us and for shared experiences. So thank you so very much, and goodbye. And it stays in a lactable. In a lactable. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Good night. Sweet dreams. Sweet bye. dreams.